Hello everybody, Super Syrupy Waffles here. Welcome to my show, and today we are not reviewing Mega Man X7. I actually did have an entire full-length review on Mega Man X7 in the works, but the problem with it was that I really didn't have much to say. Mega Man X7's problems have been brought up time and time again with relatively no differences, and I was no exception. I've had diarrhea more organized than this game. If you're looking for a video going into a deep dive into Mega Man X7, this channel is definitely not for you. I'm sure that there are plenty other review channels that have shared my similar opinions towards X7, which, to remind you, are all awful. So without further delay, let's move into Mega Man X8, which is a game that nearly nobody talks about. Probably because it sold like what, like eight copies? <laughs> Released in 2004 for the PlayStation 2 and later on the PC, this installment marks the culmination of the Mega Man X series, blending the classic 2D platforming we've come to know and love with some minor 3D elements borrowed from X7, all with enhanced graphics, refined gameplay mechanics, and the introduction of new characters. This already seems like a major step up for Mega Man X7, and especially X6. You may be asking yourself, what exactly of value happened in X7 that we need to know before going into X8? All you really gotta know is that this kid, Axel, is a prototype of a new generation of Reploids, which are immune to the Maverick virus. And X8 shows how they're being mass-produced now. These new Reploids also come with the benefit of having a copy chip, which allows them to transform into others. The plot of this game is about as simple as it gets. Good guys go beat the bad guys and maybe save this one... Ch chick? This, th this one chick along the way? Uh, hang on a second. Okay, he uses male pronouns. I'm seeing a trend. This guy, Lumine, is the director of the New Fangled Jacob Project, which essentially is meant to migrate humans to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! This would seem like a pretty good plan if Lumine himself wasn't shady AF. Here in the opening cutscene, he demonstrates a bunch of these new-gen Reploids helping him build the elevator to space by using their copy chips to transform like Axel. And the Reploid they choose to copy? Sigma. So, if you couldn't tell, yes, Lumine is a bad guy, and all the new gen Reploids are bad too. I'm glad we aren't having Sigma as the big bad this time around, but the story couldn't have been this blatant with it. So, pretty much ignoring what just happened, we jump into our first level here, and right away you can tell that this is gonna be one hell of a different experience. The movement here is insanely different from previous X games. Everything feels a lot faster and snappy, which can definitely get some time to get used to. Especially since even the weakest of enemies can wipe out chunks of your health if you're not careful enough. You have the ability to swap in and out with two selected hunters, similar to X7's mechanic, but at least now we can play as X at the start, giving you a reason to select different hunters. Once again, I'm taking a jab at X7, I think that thing caused the Irish potato famine. The most notable inclusion I noticed right away was the voice acting. It's actually pretty good this time. It's not mind-blowing or anything, but it's certainly better than anything we've seen before. I don't know what the deal is, but Vile kept talking about some new world beginning. X and Zero's voices are definitely some of my favorites, and a few of the Mavericks we'll see down the line have some pretty good voices too. Of course, since this is a Mega Man game, even with good overall voice acting comes some bad apples here and there. The minerals we mine here are essential to the development of space! I don't suppose a half-baked prototype like you could guess what I'm getting at! I don't suppose a twat like you could guess what my line delivery's getting at! This intro stage is really meant to introduce the player to the new mechanics and platforming style that this game is going for, and I think that it succeeds at it. It's quick, fun, and certainly more interesting than anything we've seen in previous X games. <laughs> After you take down a giant crab robot, Vile, of all people, shows up to taunt everybody that he's caught Lumine, to the shock of X. It should also be of note that it is absolutely never explained how Vile managed to come back. Was he rebuilt? Was he found somewhere? Because you gotta think, the last time we saw Vile was in X3, which, to remind you, was five games ago! But hey, I'm not really complaining. Vile's a sick character. 
and I'm glad he's been relegated to this constant nuisance during the game, showing up just whenever he feels like it, sort of like a rival in Pokemon. And in classic Mega Man fashion, X just lets him get away with Lumine, and we go straight to the stage select, introducing us to our selection of Mavericks. And let me just say, you can really tell that they were crunching for time finding animals to turn into killer robots. Bamboo, Pandemonium, or Earth Rock, Trilobite, Optic, Optic Sunflower, G Gigabolt Man Award. Another new feature gets introduced here in the form of three selectable navigators to help tag along on your adventure. We still have Alia, who is there to help with general advice in a stage. We have Pallet, who specializes in finding hidden collectibles on the stage. She's the best one. And we have Lair, who specializes in PUSSY! These navigators provide valuable information and assistance during gameplay, contributing to both the story and the strategic elements of the game. Finally, a game that makes Alia useful. Who would have thought? Uh... I guess I'll pick Earthrock Trilobite first, he looks pathetic enough. Minerals. This level is essentially an auto-scroller where you're getting chased by this giant mechanoloid here. It doesn't go on for far too long, and once you smacked it in the face with this crane enough times, you gotta run all the way back to the beginning. And just like that, you've reached the end of the stage where you have to take it down again. That's it? Yeah, although this stage normally would take you around five minutes to finish, there really isn't a lot to talk about here. It's nothing bad, but certainly nothing good either. And oh great, the first boss is here. The minerals we mine here are essential to the development of- Alright, so this boss is pretty similar to the- Oh crap, I died. Well, I guess I should just retry then. There are essential to the development of- Alright, so this boss is pretty similar to Crystal Snail from X2, in the sense that the main mechanic here is that you can remove the boss's shell. His attacks are more than manageable, but can definitely offer a fair challenge if you don't know what you're doing. And I guess this brings me to the point that bosses this time have the ability to use desperation attacks, which can really mess you up. Trilobite's desperation attack is very easy to dodge and doesn't really offer much of a challenge. Overall, a really fun first boss. This is totally where you should start off the game, as lackluster as this stage is. Gigavolt Man o War, what an interesting character. Despite the really specific animal choice, this design is actually pretty appealing to me. Instead of being water-themed like all of the other aquatic mavericks, Man of War goes against this trend and is mainly designed after a UFO, which fits him because all he really does is fly around. Say what you want about his boss fight or his voice, but I really enjoy this guy. This stage, Dynasty, feels like it was half of a much bigger one. It's easy, ends in about 40 seconds, and you're just at the boss like that. Not only that, but Man of War's weakness turns him into a vanishing act. Excuse me, what was that? Sorry, one more time? Maybe one more time isolated? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, so not only is Man of War's voice actress the same as Alia's, but she was directed to say whatever random crap she wanted. This means that we now have such quotes like Elbow juice, peppermint, hair cream, potato salad, muffin! So overall, the only thing I could say about this stage is Absorption <laughs> And here is the second most ridiculous character in this game, Bamboo Pandemonium. The main gimmick of this stage is using the ride armor that you can get at the very beginning, which if going for 100% completion, is required to have until the very end. This would be a perfectly fine concept in any other X game, but the item placements here had to be extra and be the worst in the entire franchise. It also doesn't help that if you die or lose the ride armor somewhere, you'd have to replay the entire stage from the very beginning. It takes nearly two minutes to get to where the first collectible is, making each replay a slog to trudge through. Who decided that this was an acceptable stage design? I don't know, and I don't care at this point. But possibly the worst offender of all is the road to the last rare metal, where you have to leave your ride armor on a conveyor belt, which looks no different from any of the other ones, use the prickle barrier item, which you can buy from the shop on the conveyor belt, and get to the elevator and into the ride armor in time before it leaves or you run out of invincibility frames. Explaining why this is extremely cruel and poorly designed isn't even needed, as it just speaks for itself. There is no way that somebody figured this out on their own. There is no way. 
But aside from these awful problems, the stage on its own isn't too bad. Even if it's milking a gimmick to death like all the others, this stage is probably the closest you'll get to a normal Mega Man X level, and it's honestly quite a shame. The boss isn't horrible either. I'm usually not a fan of big boss fights in these kinds of games, but Bamboo Pandemonium gets a free pass from me. The telegraphs on his attacks do the job well, so whenever you get hit by them, it really does feel like your fault. His voice acting, on the other hand, is awful. I have no idea what direction they were going for, because all it sounds like is your 80-year-old grandpa telling you a war story. All of history has been spent making things whose sole purpose is to destroy. It's either that, or he sounds way too sexy when you put the right music over it. What wishes for destruction is this world. We're just helping it along and giving it what it wants. Alright, so here's the first fine stage of the game. It introduces this new spotlight gimmick, which I could only assume to be inspired by the Metal Gear series, as it was heavily popular at the time of this game's release. I actually really enjoy the idea of putting the player in these kinds of stealthy environments, as it makes you think a little bit more about what you're doing. The only problem with this gimmick is that it really isn't expanded upon as you progress, which is a real shame. I think this idea had a lot of potential. And just like Bamboo Pandemonium, we have another set of overly convoluted collectibles to go and look for. Fortunately for the player, the game actually does go out of its way to at least give you a hint of how this sequence of events works, unlike the previous level where it just gave you a hint of... where it is. After getting inside of this hidden area only accessible with Axel's copy chip, you shoot this generator object here with the weapon you get from Manowar. This turns on all the lights in the facility, getting rid of the stealth gimmick entirely. You grab yourself a few rare metals and eventually grab this rare chip which you can only find when the lights are on. Overall, a pretty alright secret for those willing to experiment a little bit. This, as you can probably tell, is a common theme in X8, as a lot of these complicated routes to collectibles reward the player for experimenting with items or abilities, which I do think is a fine idea. The only problem with this is that a lot of these items aren't mentioned at all by Palette or by any of the other navigators, leading to a lot of unneeded stage revisits if you don't have a guide. It's a flawed concept, but at least it isn't as annoying as some of the items in X6 were. Anyway, after you make it through the level, you're met with another really good boss fight. Dark Mantis presents quite a challenge, as most of his attacks need to be dodged with quick and precise movement as he darts from wall to wall. This is most greatly amplified in his desperation attack, where he jumps to the top of the room and slashes with his claws. Something I constantly messed up on when I first played this game. And thus, Dark Mantis is defeated, letting us know that we've essentially just beaten the game and the rest of it is just a waiting game. Alright, like, overrated as fuck. No, 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 I found it! Alright, here's the bad parts again. Legit, I think that this is the second shortest level in the game if you know what you're doing. The only section of this stage that isn't an auto-scroller or part of a boss fight is one singular platforming gauntlet that lasts maybe about a minute. You see, this is really where you can begin to notice that Mega Man X8 out of the entire series is the one that milks the hell out of its gimmicks, with this level being a prime example of that. This elevator segment is used three whole times in the stage, and it's not like it gets any harder, changes layouts, no! It stays nearly exactly the same, which is unbelievably lame. Not to mention, even if you're going for a perfect 100% playthrough with next to no backtracking, you still gotta play and complete most of this level twice. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but holy hell it sure does feel like it. And I'm not even sure if anyone could achieve that on their own, because these collectibles are in some of the most backwards-ass locations. The first collectible is in this glory hole in the wall here, which can only be accessed by going all the way down to the bottom of this section, using Axel's copy chip on this singular enemy that doesn't appear anywhere else in the game, and climbing all the way back up to the hole, performing a very specific maneuver to get inside, just to be rewarded with a crappy item for zero that has literally next to no purpose aside from looking like a really fun whack-a-mole hammer. Actually, no, that's a lie. There is a use for this whack-a-mole hammer, because you gotta revisit this stage to go back to this garbage section to smack this random part of the floor with Zero's hammer to get another rare metal.
The boss of this stage isn't anything special, it's just a lot of waiting, it's garbage. I think by this point I've made my point clear that making the effort to find these bullshit rare metals is a complete waste of time. Especially when you take into consideration that they offer so little to the actual gameplay to assist the player. And it really doesn't help that after all the effort of finding and collecting these rare metals, you have to spend a small fortune just to use the item that you found. This is most evident in the other weapons that you can pick up for zero, as these things are a complete waste as most of them offer nothing compared to the D-Glaive's range and strength. In fact, I think that some of them are even weaker than the default Z-Saver. <sighs> okay, I'm getting way too ticked off. Next stage, please. <laughs> Now that we finally passed the absolute worst that this game has to offer, we can finally start to get to places that I can actually say I enjoy. Primrose involves the expansion of a gimmick introduced back in Dark Dizzy's stage from X5, in the form of gravity manipulation. Red buttons flip the stage upside down, and the green buttons flip the stage on its sides. A simple but effective mechanic. This stage, unlike the rest of this game, remembers that Mega Man X's level design works best when its gimmicks are ones that integrate themselves into the basic gameplay loop without breaking the game's pace, which this stage's gravity mechanic excels at. It gives us an introduction to the mechanic, an expansion of the mechanic, and a final challenge that experiments with everything else presented in the stage. Notice how the rest of this game handles its gimmicks, where 9 out of 10 times, you're just thrusted right into the new gameplay style without any ease of control. This stage also doesn't have completely obtuse item locations, as all of them involve thinking outside of the box with the mechanics that the stage presents to the player with a clear reward in sight. For instance, in order to get this armor upgrade for X, you need to figure out a way to get one of these blocks in this room over to the other end of the death spike pit by flipping gravity in a specific way. Gee, who would have thought that very clearly presenting a goal and challenge would be rewarding to figure out, huh? The one downside to this stage is that I'm left wanting more of it, which if that's the only issue, you're doing a damn good job. How on earth did they manage to make such a simple stage this good but all the other ones so crappy? This is insane! Unfortunately, the boss suffers from what I like to call Mega Man 7 Syndrome, as the boss's weakness utterly annihilates any semblance of challenge by paralyzing the boss from ever doing anything else. But aside from that, I really like that this boss is probably the only one that utilizes stage mechanics with the attack patterns, which is really neat to see. <laughs> This level is... interesting. It's just like Gravity Antonia, an Optic Sunflower stage reused and repurposed an older gimmick in the form of Cyber Peacock's ranking system back in X4. Essentially, Optic Sunflower stage is a series of combat trials which get more and more difficult as the stage continues. To get all the collectibles in this stage, you have to achieve a perfect rank in all of the trials, which I'm convinced that the D-Glaive is damn near essential to get. The time limits of getting a perfect rank on these trials can sometimes just be barely reached with the D-Glaive's strength which I think was an intentional design choice. The only problem I have with this stage is that there really isn't a whole lot of variety to spice up these challenges, as they're all pretty much the same thing, where you have to fight a bunch of these weak enemies over and over again. It's pretty monotonous, but they're all like three seconds long, so that's not too bad. And the music in this level is once again an utter jam. The boss of this stage is also... fine, it involves a whole lot of waiting, but the attack patterns are pretty fun to memorize. What do you want me to say? It's another ride bike level where you shoot stuff, it's boring. The boss has like two attacks, it's boring. Next. Oh wait, that 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 was all of them? That that was that, that was all of the Maverick stages? Oh. Man, what a sloppy lot of stages. I remember liking a lot more stages in X8, but when I look back at them objectively, the more I realize that a lot of them just aren't very good. It's really weird, like when I first started work on this video after playing the game, I thought it was really good. 
But now that I'm critically looking at it, this game has just some of the lamest level design out of the entire X series. Every stage except for Burn Rooster and Gravity Antonian put me in such a weird spot, as I truly don't think any of them are bad, it just painfully average. They have fun and unique gimmicks at some points, but man, they don't go anywhere interesting with them. As the moment things start to pick up, the stage just drops off and ends. I expected there to be more beyond the mini-boss and Trilobite stage. I expected you to explore the city in Manowar stage. I expected an actual level in Avalanche Yeti stage. I could go on. I see people use the term, it starts high and ends low, but Mega Man X is just all over the place. I would even argue the game never even starts. So after all of that, surely the end stages will change my opinions on X8. They don't, do they? Alright, so now that we've beaten all the main stages, we gotta go beat up Sigma for the eighth time. This unfortunately means that we have to endure another auto-scrolling level, but at least this one is okay. The action here is non-stop, and I bet it would've been even more fun if I had experimented a little bit more with my weapons. There's nothing really to say here other than at the end we get an actual boss fight against Vile. <laughs> Don't you ever get tired of the whole justice thing? Don't you ever get tired of being Sigma's lapdog? <laughs> it's actually fairly challenging, but that's mainly in part due to his entirely luck-based desperation attack he uses right at the end. I'm sure there's a pattern to it, but as far as I'm concerned, you gotta have the luck of an Irishman to avoid taking damage here. Weirdly enough, this isn't the last time we'll see Viola in this game, because he's still got a little bit of juice left in him. Overall, Jacob shows a little bit of promise, but unfortunately, this is really the only true last stage of the game, as the last two levels that we're going to be looking at don't really offer very much. Oh dang, this level has some pretty cinematic music. I wonder what awaits me past this strangely early boss- And it's a boss rush. Okay, yep, okay, I'm done. I'm done, I'm done, okay, yeah. Why have interesting stages? Why? Why have interesting stages when you can just make a freaking boss run? Oh hey, Sigma's here, but it's not really Sigma because it's just another one of those new gen reploids copying his DNA. Hooray! This is the final level of the most mediocre Mega Man game that has ever been released. Its mission, to have copies of Sigma everywhere, to have a really easy fight against Vile, and have way too many goddamn spikes. Okay, come on, I get that the final levels in the Mega Man X games significantly drop in quality, but this is just ridiculous, come on! There is nothing to talk about here. I could be filling this up with like 20 minutes of extra content if there was an actual level here, but there's nothing! Not even the fight with Lumine can make this any better because I mean, look at the, the whoa, 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 what's he doing, what's he doing, what's he doing? <laughs> I gotta say, that was probably one of the, the best boss fights in a Mega Man game. And the, the game... the game ends. That... that's it. Is this how it feels? Is this how it feels to have something good... ...and for it to just be taken away from you, like that? You, you know, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done doing reviews. I'm done. It's over. Oh!